Thank you. Uh, not sure how I'm going to follow that, but I'll give it my best shot. <laughs> um, Dana said, uh, I'm a farmer. I'm a young farmer. I farm, run a market garden in uh, Devon, which I'm hoping to show you a picture of. There we go. Um, on the edge of Dartmoor in Devon, where we supply, um, we produce weekly veg boxes of seasonal vegetables for our local community. The way we farm uh, and grow our produce is probably quite different to, uh, and the way we sell our produce is probably quite different to what you might expect from a normal farm. Uh, and I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a minute. But um, first of all, I'd just like to say something about farming in general <clears throat> and why it's something you may not have considered um, getting involved in in the future. On the whole, um, agriculture doesn't seem to get talked about much these days, um, maybe compared to Premiership Football or EastEnders or even the X Factor, something like that. <clears throat> um, and it's also something that maybe your careers advisor probably hasn't suggested that you can get involved with after you leave school or go to university. Even in a relatively rural area like Bath, where we've got, uh, there's farmland within just a mile of the town centre, there's probably the impression as well that you can only really get into farming if your parents own a farm, um, or if you're prepared to work for not very much money at all, herding sheep or cows, or scrabbling around in the mud picking cabbages. And it probably doesn't help that, um, on the whole, most of the times we see farmers on the news or on the telly, they seem to be complaining about something. Um, whether it's the weather, um, or the price of milk, or the badgers. You might notice the badgers have been getting it in the neck recently. <clears throat> but it's important to recognise that it hasn't always been this way. Um, not that long ago, um, what happened on your local farm, and farming in general, was relevant to everyday life and t uh, relevant to everyday conversations. Before supermarkets and online shopping, um, farmers tended to sell to their local communities because that's what made sense. Uh, and because local people bought local food, they tended to take a much more active interest in what was going on on their local farm. Even the traditional school summer holiday was timed to coincide with the busiest time on the farm when school children and teenagers like yourselves could get involved with the farm harvest and get the harvest in before the weather changed in the autumn. And this actually is where the word agriculture comes from, because unlike um, football or EastEnders or perhaps even the X Factor, uh, food and farming is something that appeals to everyone without exception. Uh, everyone has to eat, and food, by its nature, tends to bring people together. Today, however, things have changed. Um, farming is no longer commonly a community activity. This is a picture of our community getting involved with a box day on our own farm. <coughs> Along with everything else, farms have tended to get bigger and more specialised, um, and mechanisation has encouraged us to increase the amount of work that can be done by a single person and reduce the overall numbers of people being um, or involved in farming in general. The way people buy food has also changed. Uh, many farmers are simply unable to sell their produce to their local community because the infrastructure just simply doesn't exist anymore, while uh, supermarkets have kind of changed the way we think about food and what we expect from it. It tends to be the cheapest price that people now look for uh, in food rather than the highest quality or healthiest option. And this inevitably has had a knock-on effect on farm livelihoods and um, farmers as they've been forced to cut costs and compromise themselves really in an effort to make a living from the land. And as a result, we really do have to ask ourselves, is it any wonder that farmers are often seen as stressed or unhappy or that farming isn't often a, a, um, recognised as a viable livelihood? And that's all the pessimistic stuff out of the way. What I'm really here to talk to you about is why I believe that a return to agriculture and involving communities in their food production once again can make farming a much more attractive livelihood and can also give something back to us as consumers who feel disconnected from our food. So as I said, I'm a young farmer. Um, I make a living from farming, but um, I'm not from a farming family. Uh, we don't even own any land. Uh, I was, however, fortunate to have grown up somewhere where farming is very much part of the landscape. Um, somewhere where I could find work on farms while I was growing up learning farming skills. Through spending a lot of time outdoors, um, I learned to value things slightly differently. Um, I learned to value, above all else, really a good view while I work. Um, I learned to enjoy being out in the weather, um, whether it was um, raining, sunny or snowing. Uh, and I've even learned to enjoy scrabbling around in the mud picking cabbages. Uh, I've learned to appreciate the value of producing something from the sun, the soil and hard work. Uh, whether it's a vegetable, a lamb, a calf, or even simply a field of grass. Uh, and importantly, from my point of view, I've also learned the value of traditional farming skills that have shaped the countryside and the landscape where I grew up. 
So I went to university and studied agriculture, um, where we were taught that the only way to really make a living from farming was through large-scale intensive systems um, using plenty of agrochemicals and machinery. Uh, and after studying this for three years, I became more convinced than ever that industrial agriculture doesn't really have the um, environmental, social, or economic resilience to feed us into the future. So I started to look for alternatives. Um, when I left university, I started to work, uh, carried on working part-time on farms while also learning to write about what I saw was the need for a, um, a, an alternative to the existing model of farming. And it's while writing about this that I visited a community-supported farm. And I remember it was like a revelation for me. It was like the first time I'd seen what truly resilient farming actually looks like, uh, the farming of the future, as I saw it. Community-supported farming um, is a, a term used to describe a type of farming that does one particular thing differently. Uh, it actively involves its customers in the production of their own food, the culture of where their food comes from. Most of these farms do this in a very similar way by asking their customers to um, sign up for a veg share for an entire year, for an entire season in advance, um, whether it's a sheep, a veg box, or um, cheese, or whatever it may be. Uh, it's a bit like getting a magazine subscription, but instead of a magazine, you get your produce each week. Now, from a farmer's point of view, uh, this system actually relieves, this model relieves a lot of stress. Um, to be honest, farming is a quite a stressful um, stressful industry and in that you're taking a gamble every year that firstly what you're growing will survive without being hit by drought or disease um, or pests um, and secondly that there'll be customers willing to buy your produce when it comes time to harvest it. And this uncertainty is really why many farmers face little choice but to use fertilizers and pesticides in an effort to minimize this risk and maximize their chance of being paid for all of their hard work. The difference with community-supported agriculture is that the bulk of your produce is sold at the beginning of the season in advance. So um, as a result, you tend not to have to rely on fertilizers, pesticides, and intensive farming. Instead, you're able to adopt a more low-input ecological approach. Importantly, it also puts you directly in touch with your consumers, the customers who are buying your food. Uh, so you're able to get direct feedback on ways you can improve the farm, uh, and also the satisfaction of simply meeting the people who are eating your, your vegetables. From the customer's point of view, uh, they also find that once they've made this initial commitment, they tend to take a much more active interest in what goes on on the farm, uh, how the animals are kept, how the, the veg is progressing through the season, how the weather affects certain crops. And importantly, they tend to also get much better value for their money because they're not paying extra for retail, marketing, and transport of their food like you have to do at the supermarket. So having visited a number of these farms um, up and down the country in 2008, I was fortunate to attend a public meeting in my own community where a number of people expressed an interest in buying locally produced vegetables which weren't then available. So along with a couple of friends, we set about um, renting a piece of land, um, getting a startup grant, and producing our first year's supply of vegetables. Uh, we launched Chag Food Community Market Garden in March 2010 on a one-acre field with the objective of supplying our local community with a seasonal supply of ecologically produced vegetables. Uh, we chose a seasonal supply because we wanted our customers to be aware of exactly what could be grown on their doorstep throughout the, throughout the farming year. Uh, and an ecological supply because we strongly believe that um, a health, um, healthy soil is the foundation for healthy food and a hearty culture. And um, the best way to look after your soil is to farm ecologically. Two and a half years on, and we're now supplying 73 veg shares a week to our local community. Um, and we've just expanded onto another five acres of land. Uh, although we received an initial grant to get the scheme off the ground, we were quite clear that we wanted the scheme to buy the farm to be financially self-sufficient within two years, and we finally achieved this in April this year. One of the things that perhaps sets us apart at Chag Food um, is that we don't have a tractor, but instead we rely as much as possible on working horses for the, for the cultivation of our soil and weeding of our vegetables. Um, that may seem old-fashioned and romantic, but I strongly believe that we need to cut the amount of fossil fuel used to produce our food. Now, we currently use about 10 calories of fossil fuels to produce just one calorie of food, which is inherently unsustainable. As a result, I believe that working horses will have a justifiable role to play in the future of, future of food production in the, in the UK. As well as cutting dependence, uh, our use of diesel and fossil fuels, um, using working horses reduces the compaction of our soil, um, giving it a healthy structure and a healthy population of soil microbes. And I also personally believe that um, traditional farming skills like working with horses must be kept alive for future generations. And it's really our responsibility as young farmers to make sure that they are. 
Before we launched Chagfood, um, I had no experience whatsoever with working with horses. Uh, but I did manage to persuade one of the most experienced horse farmers in the country to take me on as a part-time apprentice for a year. Uh, through working alongside him, I was able to pick up his skills and knowledge and expertise and develop the confidence to train my own workhorse, Samson, uh, to work on our fields. And this is something that I would really like to emphasize, regardless, really, of whichever career you decide to go into. I think the, um, the value of apprenticeships has been lost over the past couple of decades. I think uh, you really can't underestimate just how much you can learn uh, from spending a few weeks, a couple of days, or even a couple of hours with someone who's been doing a particular job for a number of years. And it's really a unique opportunity as young people without too many commitments when you can work for very little money or perhaps no money at all in some cases in return for this priceless knowledge and experience. So looking to the future at Chagfood, um, we've recently imported a state-of-the-art horse-drawn tillage tool. They do exist <laughs> from the Amish in the States, um, which we're now working with two horses. We're hoping this will revolutionize the efficiency of our farming system. Um, and we've also experimented this year for the first time with growing wheat um, cereals for making bread, and this is something we'd also like to expand going into the future. Just to finish off, I'd just like to say, um, pick up on something that one of the speakers from last year's conference, Dave Cornthwaite, spoke about, and also Jeanette picked up on it as well this morning. It's about the importance of prioritizing happiness. I think Dave is an adventurer, uh, if you've seen his speech from last year. He's an adventurer who's um, he skateboarded across Australia, he's paddled down the Mississippi, and he's now planning to row single-handedly across the Atlantic. And when he was here last year, he spoke about how his adventures make him feel like he's living his life to its full potential. And as a result, that gives him a profound sense of happiness and fulfillment. And I must admit that when I'm working with my horse in a field producing quality vegetables, surrounded by a view that I know and love, that also gives me a profound sense of happiness. I think it seems funny to say it, but in many ways we're encouraged a lot more in today's society to be unhappy than to be happy. Um, whether it's the bad news stories that are constantly on the television or the radio, or um, advertising and marketing that seems to make us feel insecure and inadequate to make us buy things. It seems, it's almost accepted, it seems today, that it's okay to do a job that doesn't make you happy, as long as it pays the rent or the mortgage, or occasionally allows you to buy the latest phone or a new car. But despite that, the, fi the fact is that life is short. I consider myself extremely fortunate to have a job that just about pays the rent, but maybe doesn't allow me to buy the latest phone or a new car, because it does make me profoundly happy in many other ways. I'd just like to finish with a picture of this chap, who I hope some of you might recognize. It's Bob Marley. <laughs> I remember when I was about your age, about 17 or 18, when I heard a song by Bob Marley with a quote in it, with a line that said, life is worth much more than gold. And I remember it made me stop and reprioritize my life and my ambitions. And, and it still stays with me today, because when you think about it, life is worth more than gold. And whatever it is you choose to do with your life, whether it's farming, teaching, healthcare, or even singing on the X Factor, whatever it is, you owe it to yourself to prioritize your happiness, because it's not only a healthy soil, but also healthy and happy people who are the foundation of a hearty culture. Thank you.